Okay, this is our topic for today, pharmaceutical supply chain. So today we are going to look at the procurement component. Okay, so let's look at the objectives. So we are going to understand the principles of procurement as well as the processes, the key terminology and the concepts of procurement. Procurement happens in um, a regulatory environment. We are not going to look at uh, the acts, but we will refer to the acts that pertain to our scenario as Zambia. We also look at what is pre-qualification and how it it is helpful. We'll look at the methods of procurement and when to use the methods, in which situations. We'll look at the advantages of long-term agreements. And then we, will, we are going to look at information that is required in a typical contract. So what is procurement? So procurement is the overall process of acquiring goods, civil works and services. So we need to understand the, two as the three aspects, the goods, the civil works and the services. So the civil... Okay, so the, the goods, these will be the physical products like pharmaceuticals. Then the civil works, this pertains to construction. And then the services will pertain to services that will be rendered. For example, consultancy services or cleaning services, if it's a hospital scenario. And then procurement includes the function from the identification of needs. So we have to identify a need. What are we procuring? Who has raised the need for a certain procurement? Is it budgeted for? Then we have to select what we are procuring. I think for us, our concern is drugs. So we saw how drugs are selected. And then we have to solicit for the sources, where are we going to procure and from who? We have to look at those questions. And then procurement also has to look with the preparation and award of the contract. And then it also encompasses the phases of contract administration. So the contract award is the final step in uh, the procurement process. But we don't just award the contract, we have to monitor and manage the contract. We'll see how we move on. So what is the purpose of procurement? We want to meet the needs of the purchaser. We want to look at the quality and the quantity, the time and the location. So with medicines, quality is a priority. Quantities also have to be carefully quantified because we are going to over procure if we are not careful. We are going to under procure if not careful. And then the consequences cannot be overemphasized. Also time, we need to procure in time so that we don't cause service disruptions. We don't cause disruptions in the various hospital pharmacies. And then when we procure, we have to deliver to the right location. If the location is wrong, the impact is big in the supply chain. The consequences are uh, 
No, I'm being warned that the meeting went in 10 minutes. Hello? We are going to log in again. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm going to resend the, the password. Okay. Okay, sir. All right. So, procurement also is concerned with the value for money. Value for money means you see, you cannot procure drugs that are going to expire. That does not constitute value for money. Value for money means whatever you've procured has to be consumed. It has to make the impact you've procured a product for. So there has to be value for money. And then the value for money has to go hand in hand with the quality and the cost. So if you are going to look at the cost only to say this drug is cheap without paying attention to quality, when the quality problems begin to manifest, you are going to spend more money. So don't look at the cost only, no. You have to balance between the cost and the quality. Let's look at the terminology for us to understand the process of procurement. So there are what are called buffer stocks. So these are safety stocks or reserve stock, okay? That should be kept in hand so that we have no stock out. So at the time we are making procurement, we are planning for procurement of drugs. There has to be reserve stock in the hospitals. If these reserve stocks are depleted, can you mute your microphones, please? Who is that one? If the reserve stock is depleted, there will be a stock out. So you don't procure when your shelves are zero. That's, that's wrong management. And then also buffer stocks seek to, you know, guard against delayed deliveries, okay? Sometimes there can be an increased demand of a product, especially in an epidemic like we have. Or sometimes they're just unexpected events. So we have to manage this very carefully. There's also the concept of the central medical store. So in general, this is a parastatal body. In many countries, the parastatal body like a medical store is the one that is going to manage procurement. But in Zambia, this is not the case. But if you look at the new act, the ZAMSA Act, which you should download after this lecture, ZAMSA, the new organization that will succeed medical stores, has been given the mandate to procure. So perhaps by the time you'll be graduating, ZAMSA will have been procuring drugs. So for those who want to specialize in the supply chain, you, you can look at um, the establishment that is in the ZAMSA Act, okay? And then a central medical store stores and distributes health products for the public sector. So this lesson is looking at the public sector generally, but the same principles can be applied in the private sector. The INCO terms, this should be embedded in the contract to avoid disputes and misunderstandings. So these are international commercial terms. They are abbreviated as INCO terms. Okay, so these are internationally recognized. It allows the buyer and the seller to agree. It removes ambiguity, okay, in the costs and the risks that are involved in a transaction. Okay, so it simply stipulates between the buyer and the seller who does what. 
Then international non proprietary names. I think this is occurring in all our lectures so far. So these are officially agreed generic names for a pharmaceutical substance. You can look at it in this way. There's also lead time. So lead time is very important. Remember we looked at time. If we don't manage time carefully, what we procure will be late. And this will have an impact in the public health delivery system. So what is the lead time? So you look at the time between the time you sign that contract to the time the medicines will be delivered for use, okay? And then pre-qualification, this is a concept whereby for chronic diseases like HIV, TB and malaria, to avoid the bureaucracy that goes in quality control, WHO pre-qualify a supplier, meaning those goods don't have to be tested. Once you receive them, they have to be distributed for use. No need for quality control. So what does pre-qualification pre looks at? It looks at the capacity of the supplier to comply with the manufacturing standards. So pre-qualification specifically applies for specific products for a specific period of time. There's also the terminology of quarantine. This, this can be administrative. So this simply means you are separating stock that is received. So the stock that is already in storage and the stock that you've received, the new stock shouldn't be mixed. Okay, so there shouldn't be any mixture there. The stock that is received can only be mixed with the stock that is already in storage when it passes quality control. And then the concept of the supply chain. So the supply chain is simply a system of storage points where supplies are kept. This would be in warehouses or intermediate warehouses like hubs or even in the peripheral uh, service areas like, you know, rural health centers, okay? So let's understand the supply chain in terms of that flow. Then there's also the TRIPS agreement. So TRIPS stands for Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, all right? So these will be international agreements. And among other things, there are a lot of exceptions. Can Eliam, can you mute your microphone, please? You are disturbing us. Eliam, we have a, can you mute your microphone? You are disturbing the class. Can you get instructions, please? So, can, can someone talk to Eliam, please? He seems not to be getting me. So the TRIPS agreement applies in situations where the drug is new. Because if a drug is new, no one is allowed to market or distribute it apart from the originator company. So in this case, in terms of a global emergency like COVID-19, all the new drugs that will be, you know, approved, vaccines, drugs, they've got patents and it's not a guarantee that countries like Zambia will be. So I was talking about the TRIPS agreement and the intellectual property rights. I've explained that 
in in times of global emergencies it poses a challenge for countries to access drugs that are under patent so with this agreement a new drug that will be approved today definitely won't be accessed by zambia but with this agreement any country has got the right to disregard the patent so long they put it in writing to the world trade organization so what simply needs to be done is for that if that country has the capacity to synthesize a good example i think is remdesivir and the new vaccines that are in pipeline under patent but if they are approved there's no way zambia will access them at the price that is affordable so the minister of commerce trade and industry simply needs to write to the world trade uh, organization and he simply needs to um produce a statutory instrument then any company resided in zambia with the capacity can manufacture that particular program is that clear now at this stage i want to ask you what is a statutory instrument i think we've had the versailles in the press in the recent past even in the wake of covid-19 the minister of health issued the an SI on public health regulation. What is an SI? Who can explain the benefit of others? Uh, let me try, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, what does it stand for? Thank you. Is is a, is a statutory instrument? Yeah, it's it's a statutory instrument, right? Yeah. So, yes. What? Well, so how does it work? What's the purpose of a statutory instrument? It's um, it's when they feel there's a certain clause in in a law that needs to mm -hmm. be changed. Okay. That needs to, yeah. That needs to change. That that needs to be changed to to suit a certain um, uh, situation. Situation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You are very right. You are very right. Excellent. So you. you understand that the acts of parliaments are ca cast in concrete, right? You you interpret them as they are. So. The acts of parliaments, all of them in themselves, they are not flexible to enforce certain measures that are critical. For example, closing bars, right? The president cannot just say, oh, bars closed. We are not a dictatorship as Zambia, no. We are a democracy. So when a president makes an announcement, the way the president made an announcement, regarding the decision to close bars, right? He made that announcement at the time the Minister of Health, okay, had also started invoking the statutory instrument. Okay, and then the president signed the instrument. After signing, he made an announcement. So that's how democracies work or governments work right it's not it's not by decree no so even the 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 the, the trips agreement if it has to be invoked by the minister of commerce trade and industry allowing a, any company to manufacture a drug that is under patent okay the president will sign and then the minister will make an announcement after the instrument has been signed okay so basically understand the trips agreement in terms of patents okay we move on you have a question 
Somebody has got the microphone on. Can you? Hello? Peter Malupeng and Florence, what's the problem? Didn't we get the instructions in the email? Can someone advise this police? Hello? I'm sure they are disturbing everyone. Can we call them? Peter and Florence. No, my, mine is yeah. muted. How about Florence now? Okay. Let's move on. Derek. What's your problem? Okay, can we move on? Can we advise a colleague using other means to mute their microphones? I don't like the disturbances. Can we all get instructions as they will be directed in the email? Mute your microphone when you join the class. Can we move on? So who does the procurement of pharmaceutical products? For the public sector, it will be the Ministry of Health. For the NGOs who are independent organizations such as faith-based, Chas, for example, they will do their own procurement and their funding agencies in themselves, they will fund the procurement. For government procurement, they are funded by the taxpayer. They will also be procurement agents. These will be international businesses whose role is just to procure on behalf of governments or any other entity for that matter. Okay, so remember that as pharmacists, we would have a wider perspective of practice, right? Pharmacies can form, for example, procurement consortiums. You see the way retail pharmacies in Zambia are operating. That's not a good strategy. Our friends, Elsewhere, I've gone a step further. Retail pharmacies will join a procurement consortium. As a retail pharmacy, you don't have to buy anything. All you need to do is subscribe. You pay a certain amount of money to a consortium that will be run by pharmacies. Then they will buy all the drugs you need in your pharmacy. You know, the advantage is there because your products are going to, to fetch a very fair price compared to your competitors who buy on their own. The idea is when you buy drugs in bulk, it will attract a discount. So in as much as this lesson is about the public sector, some of the concepts can also be, you know, applied in the private sector. So let's not shy away Okay, be the first ones to form private, con you know, procurement consortiums. Move on. What are the types of sourcing? What is sourcing? Where, where we are buying? Okay, now there are types of sourcing. You can multi-source, meaning you can buy from several manufacturers and suppliers, for example. Okay. And then you can also do a limited source or what we call a single source. Now in a single source, there has to be, you know, circumstances that will, you know, make you single source. So for example, new medicines like remdesivir against COVID, you have no choice but to source from a single you know, organization or company. You also have products that will be difficult to manufacture. Okay, or sometimes the manufacturers maybe 
the plug in the market, they were financially viable for them to meet that, you know, contract that you've entered into. They won't be able to supply because for you to supply a very big consignment, you need financial resources. So if that particular consignment requires a lot of financial resources, you find that suppliers won't meet the expectation. So just invite a few and choose from a few. That's the concept. Pre-qualification, what is pre-qualification? In pre-qualification, we want to assess the capacities of suppliers, like I've just been talking a while ago, just now. Supplier capacity, does he have the capacity to supply the quantity that he has agreed to supply, okay? Is the supplier complying with the manufacturing standards? Because if the manufacturing standards are, are not up to date, it means the quality of the product that is going to be supplied will also be compromised, right? And then pre-qualification will apply to specific products. And also it will pre-qualify a manufacturing facility. And it's only for a specified period of time. So why pre-qualifications? Look at um, tuberculosis and uh, HIV and malaria. We won't have time, or countries won't have time, or organizations won't have time to start subjecting products to quality control each time. That bureaucracy is going to cause supply disruption. So for example, in Zambia, all the ARV medication do not need quality control. They are pre-qualified. You receive them, just put them in stock and distribute. They've been pre-qualified by the World Health Organization. Okay, so for more details, you are going to check your notes, how this mechanism is provided for. So what are the regulatory considerations? We don't just procure drugs. So as pharmacists, we are the custodians of these regulations. And ours is to advise, to say, no, we have to make these considerations. So we look at drug registration. For example, I'll give an example of remdesivir because it's the only example. Yes, McLaurin. Go ahead. Uh, is is uh, pre-qualification the same as uh, quality control? Why have no, it's not. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, but... yeah, no, go on. You said why you have us so? No, it's fine since they are different because I was thinking uh, maybe uh, a company like uh, Zabs, which uh, has been mandated to do quality control. Uh, I was thinking they're the ones that should be doing the pre-qualification as well. But since there are different aspects, then it's fine. No, they are different, but of course, for you to pre-qualify something, you have to undergo the process of quality control. So quality control is part of the pre-qualification process in short. Okay? And then only WHO can pre-qualify a product. That you have to bear in mind. No other entity apart from WHO. So let's look at drug registration. For example, remdesivir, if it's not registered in Zambia, it cannot be procured. So before you procure any drug, you have to check with Zamra if it's registered. If it's not, it cannot be procured. So, in most countries, even Zambia, it's a requirement. And this particular act of, you know, regulation is um, provided for in the, our act. The Medicines and Allied Substances Act is very clear of this regulation. 
profession. You have, you have to consider patents also. If the drugs are protected, you have to know that no, this drug cannot be found in generic form. So we have no choice but to buy the brand for now. So you have to have all this information on your fingertips. What are the methods of solicitation? How do we procure drugs? These are the four methods. We can do local shopping, all right? Visiting companies to give us three quotations, then we get the lowest. But with pharmaceuticals, I'm sorry, if you are going to get the lowest price, you are going to pay more and there's quality failure. There's also a request for quotation RFQ, then invitation to bid the NITB, and the request for, for proposal, the RFP. Let's briefly look at this in detail. So local shopping, this is a procurement method when we are buying goods and services. So if the value is less than $2,500, we can just buy without any regulations. Kennedy. Can someone talk to Kennedy? All right, now, in various SI, that SI statutory instrument that is provided for in the procurement tax, like for Zambia, local shopping cannot be $2,500. Local shopping. Who's Kennedy? Hello, I can't go on now. I think I'm receiving a lot of disturbance. Who is Kennedy? Is he listening to this program? Yes, I've told them to mute their mics, but... What, what's the problem? I don't know why he's still on. This is so disturbing, you know? The request for quotation, the RFQ. Yes? What is his name? I, I take him out. Kennedy who? Okay, I'll, I'll be removing people now who are disturbing, right? And I won't admit them in. So be aware all of you now. I'm removing people who are not complying with, you know, the requirements. So let's, let's look at uh, the request for quotation. A request for quotation focuses on goods or services from companies. So that's the range of the pricing structure. Anything uh, above the sorry, thousand? Sorry, sorry, question. Yes. You have a question? Yeah. Yes, okay, on the local shop. Local, local shopping. shopping. Yes. 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 Uh, I wanted to find out. Uh, you wanted to mention, but it's like you didn't mention because you are disturbed uh, on the amount that would qualify right. one to do a local shopping. Um, yes. Okay. All right. Now these amounts that I've illustrated here are from the the global fund guidelines, but. Zambia has got its own rules. And uh, the rules are provided for in the statutory instruments, which are revised from time to time. So here, what I want to emphasize is, if an amount exceeds a certain level, then you have to use a different method of solicitation, okay? 
So where an amount is between 2,500, for example, and $100,000, you're going to do a request for quotation if you want to buy goods and services. Okay, move on. There's also an invitation to bid, an ITB. This is the most commonest in Zambia, all right? So this one will be an open tender. It can be both local and international. And this, is, this applies to procurement of goods and civil works, okay? The volume of the contract has to exceed 100,000. So if it's a hundred thousand dollars, you cannot do an ITB. You can do maybe an RFQ. So what distinguishes these methods really is the price range, right? Then the, there's also a request for proposal. Now a request for proposal, as you can see, it only applies for services, right? Not goods. Okay, so distinguish this by the thresholds in terms of the value of that procurement you are looking at. That's the only distinguishing feature. And the other feature is some of them just apply to services. Others will apply to goods and services. There, there are also long-term agreements, all right? So these are long-term contract agreements, like they can be ranging from one to three years. And in them, there'll be multiple deliveries for that particular activity or program. So these are what advantages in that they don't disrupt. You don't have to start the bureaucracy all over again. All you do is monitor the contract as suppliers are delivering. So for, for private hospitals, as well as uh, private pharmacies, especially pharmacies, right? One of the advantages of procuring in a structured manner learning today is that you are lowering the cost. I've never seen a private hospital in this country that to advertise a tender on an RFQ, okay? okay? And for that, they are incurring a lot of costs. The drugs they are buying, if you compare with what the government buys in bulk, you find that private entities are paying a lot of money. So as pharmacists, these are the areas, clinical aspects of manufacturing manufacturing aspects, we can try to bring in as part of the improvement process, all right? I think um, in the earlier lecture, it should have been the, the overview of the supply chain. We looked at the drug budget that it consists, for example, about 25% of the total healthcare budget. This can apply to a private hospital as well. you find that maybe out of all the costs the hospital incurs. Maybe for private hospitals, drugs can amount to as much as 70 or 60 percent. So, as I do in all my lectures, I will encourage students to consider research. So you can do a research to find out whether public, also whether private hospitals are incurring a lot of drug cost or not, okay? So try to find out the extent of, you know, private hospitals soliciting bids to the public. As far as I know, no one is doing the It can also, you know, help private hospitals procuring drugs in a structured way. So that's a, a research proposal you can consider. We move on. So 
after we make all these considerations now, we have to draw up a contract. And these contracts are standardized. They are templates on the internet that relate to pharmaceutical products. So if you are going to work for the global funds, you are going to work for PSM, you are going to work for Crown Agent. By the way, we have, we have pharmacies that are actively working in these organizations. Okay, these are international organizations. And these are the skills that they need. You, you need to have skills that relate to procurement. You'll be the advisor. And the jobs that are being advertised would be supply chain advisor. So when you see an advert supply chain advisor, please pay attention to look at the qualifications they want. All right? Because if you are just going to, to expect a job event with a pharmacist title inside the headline, you are going to miss an opportunity. So understand the organization that I've mentioned. Crown Agent, there's also GSI, there's also SAFE, there's also Edge Free, there's um, the Global Fund, there's UNFPA, there's UNICEF, there's the World Health organization itself, there's UNDP. So these organizations do employ pharmacists who've specialized in the pharmaceutical supply chain. So these aspects, the procurement concepts in short, they have to be introduced whilst in training, all right? So for example, they will ask you to draft the contents of the contract. For example, UNGP will say, we are procuring ARVs for Zambia. So give us the terms of the contract. So this is the information you consider. Make sure that the names are in generic form. There's labeling requirements there. There are particular specification for dosage, the pharmaceutical form, the unit. We have 10 minutes to go, but we are finishing. Then the manufacturer's name, as well as the expiry date if required. The contract has to be specific with the packaging, the, both the primary packaging and the secondary packaging. The primary packaging is the carton. Then the secondary packaging is the individual cartons inside a large carton box. And then the language on the labels. If you don't specify that they should be in English, they will come in Russian, right? By the time they're arriving at your door, it will be too late. You can't send them back to Russia. So that's the cost you've incurred. move on. The quantities have to be stated in the contract. And the unit also, the pack size or the volume. If you don't state it in the contract, well, the supplier is going to state it for you. Don't complain. Okay. The prices have to be included per unit. If it's duty free, it has to be stated. The tax has to be given as well as the exchange rates. Even the delivery method, how are they going to deliver? If they deliver by air and they give you a call that drugs at the airport, you have to pay $25,000 to clear them. Then you should realize that I didn't do my contract very well. So the de delivery methods have to be clear. Are they going to be transported by road, by air? Are they going to be refrigerated in transit? And the INCO terms, which we'll look at in the next lesson. The payment modalities. 
Are you going to pay when the delivery is made or before delivery? And how are you going to settle the disputes? If there is a dispute, how are you going to settle it? So the contract should state. You should also state the remaining shelf life. At the time they are arriving at your door, they should be at least 75%. If you don't state these things are real in the real world, they will just bring you that is something expiring in three months. All right. And then the description of the registration requirements also state that if they are not registered, they will just be marooned at the port of entry. You have to start the process or Zamra might just dispose them off. So we have to be really careful. And the contract terms are going to control this process. Let's look at the receiving of pharmaceutical products. Who's that one? Who's that one? Give me the name of the person who is making that. It's Derek. Okay, I'm removing people here who don't want to comply. Just a minute. Just give me a minute. We're out of time. Okay, they are off. Hello? Hello? We can hear yes, you, sir. Okay, thank Can you. you. Okay, the, receive, the, the receiving of pharmaceutical products. You've placed your contract now. It, the, the quality process does not stop. What's the first stage? You have to physically inspect what has been delivered. You have to compare the documentation, the dispatch note, okay? Is what... Are the documents, the quantities that are stated in the documents, starting with the physical quantity? That's your first consideration. You don't just receive, put them in stock. You'll be shocked. You'll find that out of 10,000, there are only 3,000. And you've stamped a delivery note that says 10,000. There, according to international rules, right, you will have received 10,000. So when you're asked to put up a robust system, an SOP, these are the things you consider. Then the second stage is that, um, okay, I've mentioned that one. Then you have to open the carton boxes. You have to check the names of the products delivered, the dosages, the forms, the packaging, the labels, the expiry date, and the batch number. So these, are the considerations that you should never ever take for granted. There are also do documents that pertain to quality of products. For example, the certificate of analysis. These will be delivered together with the, the invoices and the dispatch notes. So you have to be carefully checked also if they match the products that have been delivered. And then after you are satisfied with the physical checks, the paper counter checks, you can now take the samples to the laboratory for testing, okay? So when you look at national medical stores, they all have quality control laboratories. By the way, you should know this fact, all right? Drugs that, um, found in public health facilities or government facilities. They are tested. Drugs that you are going to find in private facilities, 
no one tested them by them. So you have to, as a pharmacist, you have to As a pharmacist, you have to, to know this, all right? So you find that the rate of products in, you know, the, the private sector, that are bad quality. We don't even have information about that. So this is one research area also that you should consider. Finding out the extent of quality challenges in the private sector supply chain. Okay, so normally students will have a hard time in their final year finding um, research pro projects that they should do. So I think I'm giving you already projects that you can consider doing. Okay, so we've come to the end of the lecture.